Fire is not often associated with disaster at sea. Water tends to be the death bringer of many a maritime disaster, which is why the fate of the KMP Tempamos II stands as a stark reminder that burning to death is far worse than drowning at sea. But when your choice is one or the other, which do you pick? Before the slow downfall of the ship is unraveled, it is worth revisiting the origins because what led to the deaths of hundreds of passengers was more than the flames, but the complacency of inspectors, crew, and government. The Tampamos II was built in 1976, originally named Central No. 6, but went through many names as it passed hands over the years. By the time the vessel had been handed down to the Japanese company Komodo Marine, it had already been offered to other private firms for $3.6 million. Yet in a confusing move, she was finally sold for $8.3 million. Undoubtedly, this was a huge boon to the sellers, but it raises concerns about why a Japanese company was willing to pay hand over fist for a craft deemed unworthy for sea. That becomes clearer when you realize she was going to carry 1,500 passengers and vehicles on one of the busiest routes. Jakarta Padang and Jakarta Yuzhang Padang. Undoubtedly, the Japanese firm saw potential in the roll-on, roll-off vessel, ferrying so many people and motors over a popular journey, so you might have thought that they'd have taken more care when it came to maintaining their moneymaker. Instead, Tempamos II received perfunctory maintenance checks during its short four-hour rest. Engine problems occurred frequently, including during its maiden voyage on June 2, 1980. Politicians and journalists aboard its first trip raised questions and concerns about the repeated engine failure, yet this did little to raise awareness of the problem to the company. In fact, less than one year later, on January 25, 1981, these problems would rear their ugly head when the Tampamos II failed to make its destination on what was its final voyage. 200 motor vehicles, 1,055 passengers, 82 crew, and a couple of hundred stowaways boarded the ship in the evening of a journey that will take them two days and two nights. Yet just before the boat leaves on its long, long journey, a skipper notes that the engine had already failed. But the boat sets off on the 220-mile trip in another city in Indonesia. Given the length, everyone had settled in, either in their cabins, the bar, or even watching the band play. However, in January, the waves are higher sometimes five to seven meters with winds of 15 knots. This dramatic fallacy would have a devastating impact on what was about to unfold. It's the second night of the voyage, and one of the crew is sleeping on the back of a truck in the vehicle hold when he awakes to see bright red flames. Owing to a sea storm, the battered engine had leaked fuel, which was then ignited by a cigarette butt from a vent. Immediately, this crew member summoned help and tried to extinguish the fire, which had now spread to a cluster of Vespa scooters. But despite assistance, the crew was unable to subdue the fire. While the crew wrestled with the water hose, only able of producing immense smoke, the passengers were unaware. Many were listening to the band play a song with lyrics such as, This journey feels very sad. No one knows who was the first passenger to call out the fire, but news spread faster than the flames. Now, in the mere turn of a few minutes, there was widespread panic. The ringing of the fire bell added to the commotion of the passengers, but the real pandemonium came when the power went out. The engines were ordered to shut down for fear of causing an explosion. However, due to the faulty electronics, the power was cut. Now the entire ship was now floating in a storm, with the only lights being the stars poking through the thick smoke and the orange glowing of the growing flame. Some passengers immediately jumped to the sea. It was remarked by witnesses that those who jump at night are the ones who die a lot. The engine was then ordered to be restarted in the desperate hope of getting to a nearby island for safety, but alas, those engines did what they did best and failed. It was now that an SOS call was put out and a flare was fired, though in a twist of cruel irony would fail to detonate. The emergency generator also failed too, and putting out the fire was deemed futile. For two hours, the panic-stricken boat floated in darkness, hoping for rescue. During this time, the fire was capturing all the fuel tanks of the parked vehicles and taking out decks one by one. 
Those who were able to go to the upper deck within the first 30 minutes found few lifeboats. They could only take 50, but were overfilled, with some crew cruelly abandoning their post before the passengers could be transported off. And of those passengers who failed to make it to the relative safety of the upper decks, like those trapped in the lower decks, perished in the fiery molten pits of the ships. They were unable to escape their chambers, so hot was the temperature of the melting iron handles. And yet, things were about to get worse. The violent winds were kicking up flames, feeding the fire spread, and violent waves hitting the sides were threatening to capsize the ship. The hellish situation lasted for eight hours until, in the early sunrise, ships finally came to answer the SOS call. One boat had seen the towering, black plumes of smoke and presumed it to be that of a burning oil rig. The rescue operation went underway, but it was to be slow and uneasy due to the storm and now the settling fog. The shuttling of lifeboats had to be stopped due to the ferocious storm and lack of vision, dragging out the cruel, slow demise of the ship by many more hours. The differences in sizes between the ships also posed an obstacle. It wasn't as simple as dropping a gangway. The crew had to be lowered by a system of ropes and pulleys to be able to access the ship and pull survivors to their deck, like a macabre version of a carnival claw machine. One crew recalls immediately seeing charred corpses when he touched down on the Tempamos II, claiming to have seen the charred bodies of a mother cradling her three-year-old child. In a strange irony, one of the captains of the rescue ships was a classmate of the captain of the Tampamos. But this coincidence was not a sign of providence, but if anything, a bad omen as things once again took a turn for the worst. On the morning of January 27th, the torrential rain picked up and helped spread the flames to isolated fuels in the engine room. The engine finally exploded, causing a hole in the side. Seawater instantly entered and flooded the compartments. The generator and propeller room filled with water, causing the boat to tilt 45 degrees. As you can imagine, this impeded the rescue operation even though the fires were now being combated. But it was for naught. The Tampamos sank, taking the hundred or so passengers trapped in the lower decks to the bottom of the sea. It had floated ablaze for 30 hours, but once it took on the water, it sank in a mere 20 minutes. The exact number of survivors is contested. For example, the radio operator was found with 63 survivors in a lifeboat and a day or so later, with rescue ships recovering just over a hundred or so each. But it wasn't hard to find bodies. Captain Abdul Rivaya's corpse was found floating in the ocean, though many passengers were never recovered. The consensus on the death toll is around 400 or so, with most being trapped in the ship as it burned and sank. The ensuing investigation did not blame abnormalities on the engine room, despite its constant problems. As far as tech problems, some crew would even testify that the vessel's lack of smoke detective system played a pivotal part in the tragedy. But all in all, there was a sense of a cover-up as blame was shifted from the managerial department to the crew, though many in parliament are still demanding an investigation into the Titanic of Indonesia. Almost 50 years ago, the ship that went up in flames in the pitch black night disappeared forever under foggy waters. Yet the memory of that tragedy burns brightly in the minds of survivors. Until the Indonesian government conducts a thorough investigation, in which case the slow horror of Tampamos will be relived again. We're interested in hearing which parts of the story you found to be the most harrowing, so let us know in the comments. If you'd like more videos covering maritime disasters, then please leave a like and share this with someone who is a fan of naval history. And don't forget to subscribe to get the next video.